gentlemen, we're very pleased that you have uh, accepted our invitation tonight to listen to this uh, address on creation or evolution. Now, this is one of these subjects that excites a lot of passion in our community. There are some people who get very passionate about creation or evolution. And tonight we want to just look at some of the evidence from the Bible itself and from the things that we see around us concerning this remarkable subject. You know, evolution is a, a theory spoken of in schools, in universities, in higher education. Uh, it's become the de facto norm, if you like, in science communities. Uh, it's accepted, if you like, in society as the answer to the origin of life. And on the other hand, we have the creation record, the Bible, which is entirely different in describing the origin of life. You know, we read from Isaiah chapter 40 this evening, and if we come back to verse 25, we have this question asked by the prophet. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, said the Holy One? So, so here's a, a question that implies an answer that we cannot liken God to anything. He is unique, he is supreme, he is powerful. And it's a simple test. See, verse 26 says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things. So tonight when you go home, and if the stars are there tonight, just, just gaze up into the sky and just contemplate all those pinpricks of light. Lift up your eyes, and behold, and, and ask yourself the question, how did they get there? Now verse 26 says that God hath created these things. So it's very definite, very precise. And more so, he brings their host out by number. Now scientists today are unable to calculate the billions of stars that are in our universe, let alone beyond there. And the Bible says that God who has created them knows all their number. In fact, verse 26, he calleth them all by names by the greatness of his power, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. So man can't calculate the number of stars. God says, I met every one of them and I call them all by names. So tonight, when you go home, just, just lift up your eyes in the sky and if you can see the night sky, just think about where on earth did this power and majesty and splendour of billions of stars come from. And the Bible is very clear, God is the creator of that. Now, of course, that, that is challenged by evolution. What really is evolution? Well, evolution is, as we have there on the screen, is the change in the inherited characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. So typically the evolutionary process would need billions of years to, to unfold from a simple single cell to the more complex plants and animals and creatures and finally man himself. And, and evolution is driven by two mechanisms. The first, as we have on the screen, is DNA mutations. These are changes at the genetic level as organisms and their genes mutate and they recombine in different ways during reproduction and are passed on to future generations. So, so one of the driving forces of evolution is mutations. So for example, one organism may, through mutation, through a, a change in the DNA, grow something which is different to the previous generation and that growth is passed on to the next generation and so on. And, and over billions of years those small changes become part of the makeup of the organism. The second thing that drives evolution is what's called natural selection. Natural selection, those who inherit new characteristics are randomly given a survival and reproductive advantage. If I can evolve two eyes and I can see the predators, that gives me an evolutionary advantage to escape the predators. These processes of natural selection lead to uh, an increase in frequency of the population that become more common, says evolution, and the disadvantages become less frequent. So, if I evolve eyes and you don't evolve eyes, I have a superior advantage in my reproduction capacity to be able to escape predators and those who don't have eyes finally die out. 
Failure to evolve in response to environmental change, says the evolutionist, can and often does lead to extinction. So, so the less evolved, the less complex, the, 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 the disadvantaged eventually become extinct. So evolution has two driving forces, DNA mutations and survival of the fittest, the natural selection where nature or blind chance chooses the more powerful, the strongest, the more intelligent and those who are less intelligent those who are less capable finally are extinct. So it's a pretty brutal environment, isn't it? But those are the two forces that evolutionists say drive evolution. Now tonight, I want to give you a number of reasons why I don't personally believe in evolution and they're going to be based on the Bible, they're going to be based on observation of science. Now I'm not a scientist, but I do have the capacity, I think, to rationally explore logic and to, to rationally put together concepts and ideas. And I think you're in a very similar position. And, and I want to present the evidence tonight to, to demonstrate why, in actual fact, the belief in the theory of evolution doesn't really hold water. It's not sustainable either from scripture or from logic itself. So, so evolution has this chain from the simple cell right through to apes right through to man himself over billions of years. Well, let's have a look at some of the things which contradict that. Let's go to John chapter 17. Here's the first point I want to make. In John chapter 17, these were the words of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Very short verse, a very simple verse, but a very profound verse. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus Christ said to his disciples in his prayer to his heavenly Father, sanctify them through thy truth. The word sanctify simply means to separate. Separate them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, it's one of those absolute declarations by Jesus Christ. Thy word is truth. Now, what was God's word? Well, in the Lord's day, it was from Genesis to Malachi. It was the Old Testament, if you like. And Jesus stamped his endorsement on that by saying that God's word is truth. Now that immediately is a challenge to every one of us. How do we know it's true? Is it absolute truth or partial truth? And who is Jesus Christ anyway? You see, all those questions are prominent questions and from this place we answer those questions from time to time in our, our lectures. But you see, if that is true, thy word is truth, if God's word is truth, then that means that what the Bible speaks about in relation to the origin of man is also truth. So we read in Isaiah 40, in very wonderful language that God spreads the heavens like a curtain, counts all the stars by number, invites us to look up and examine how those could possibly be there through chance. The first chapter of Genesis describes in very sublime language the very profound way in which creation occurred. The sequence of events, the wonder and marvel of the creation of man and woman in the beginning. So see, see, that's a very challenging point, isn't it? And I believe that that is right. God's word is truth and therefore takes precedence over scientific theory. The second point is this. If God's word is truth, uh, the Bible, in fact, clearly describes God creating all things as complete and functioning organisms. Let's come back to Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the Bible. Thy word is truth. And we find that God is not creating half-evolved, half-mutated species. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, we have this very bold declaration. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So the complexity of life, the marvel of what we see around us, Genesis is very clear. It was created by God as a functioning and complete organism. So we find all the way through Genesis. Let's read, for example, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. 
God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, who sees it itself upon the earth, and it was so. Everything is made after its kind. So God made plants and animals that will reproduce as plants and animals. And after their kind was a little expression that went through Genesis chapter 1 to demonstrate that there was a fixity in the species. A plant is a plant is a plant. After its kind. There is no evolution or migration of one species to another. As far as God is concerned, he contained them within its individual kind. The second thing is, we won't turn this quotation up, but in Psalm 104 and verse 24, the psalmist says, O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. There's a quite a bit of information in that particular verse. The diversity of species, how manifold are thy works. You know, they're still discovering different species of insects and fish, bottom of the ocean. The huge diversity of life God created. How manifold are thy works, thy works, his work. In wisdom thou hast made them all. We're going to see a little bit of this wisdom in our presentation this evening. The marvel of the human body. Just in a a few little aspects. The the tremendous sense of, of scientific, if you like, amalgam of functions that are just seemingly incredible all working together. And the psalmist says that's a display of God's wisdom. And lastly... The earth is full of thy riches. There is a wealth of beauty, staggering beauty, amazing beauty, which the psalmist says is God's wealth and riches. And I'm sure you have watched a documentary on nature. I'm sure you sat back and thought, that is just magnificent. Just magnificent. The beauty and form and symmetry of all of that. That's exactly what the psalmist says. In wisdom God has made them all. The earth is full of his riches. Now that challenges evolution. If God's word is true, then that verse is also true. And so is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in all of that. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 19 to 20, we read, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth... By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. In other words, the creation of the world is governed by intelligence and knowledge and wisdom. We're going to see a little bit of that this evening. Not just life, but the earth and the heavens, the the relationship of the planet and the solar system within space. Uh, There is a design and wisdom an understanding and knowledge that the Bible says God has infused within the makeup that we find today. And we'll also examine that a little later on this evening. So, see, those are quite challenging statements. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, wealth, riches, that's the creator of the Bible. The first problem I have with evolution is this. That evolution cannot explain the first cause. What do I mean by that? Well, an evolutionist believes that, that life came from a single cell and you ask the evolutionist, where did a single cell come from? It came from amino acids. Where did the amino acids came from, come from? It came from molecules. Where did molecules come from? We don't know. Where did the planets come from? There's a big bang. So, so how do you get an explosion of planets out of nothing? We don't know. And you see, every time you ask the question, well, what's the first cause of all that? There is absolutely no answer to that. And the Bible is entirely different. So all evolution does is, even if you believe that process, it doesn't give you a starting point. It never gives a first cause. It can't. It has no answer for that. As far as the Bible is concerned, God is the first cause of everything. As we read in Isaiah 40 tonight, he doesn't grow weary, he doesn't grow faint, he is the creator of all things. So my first problem with evolution is this. 
It cannot define or explain or give any kind of idea to a first cause. It stumbles at that. Whilst the Bible is very clear, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The second is this. Evolution cannot explain male and female reproduction. We know from experience that if an animal mates with another species, then the result is a sterile creature. If a donkey mates with a horse, you get a mule that's sterile. Evolutionists say that the first reproductory systems were asexual. That is, a, a seed or a cell reproduced by itself. doesn't need fertilization from another cell. Now we've got to get from asexual cells to male and female with totally different reproductive systems. And we've got species who cannot reproduce with other species because if they do, the result's sterile. So we have here a, a cell that's asexual, reproducing, and it's got to get to this kind of complexity. Evolution has absolutely no answer to that. It can't, it can't mate with other cells because it's different species. And the result is infertility. But the Bible is absolutely clear. In the beginning God male, made male and female. And the complexity of those reproductive systems works beautifully. But to get from this single cell and to produce this kind of thing, evolution has absolutely no answer to that because cross-species pollination, cross-species fertilization produces infertility. They have no answer how a cell can become from asexual to the sexuality that we see in male and female today. If there was the process of evolution there would be evidence of transitional forms. So I expect to see within the fossil record the evidence of a half-formed, half-mutated species. I expect to see something which is going to be half an animal or an animal's developing eyes or an, an animal that's developing lungs or heart or whatever. And what we find is this. The fossil record does not support the case for natural selection. There was a, a recent book written by a man called Gleedman. It's still a textbook today and it reflects the current opinion about transitional species. This is what he says. He's evolutionists. No fossil or other physical evidence directly connects man to ape. The problem for gradualists, that, that's this slow movement of life through the transitions, those who support gradual evolution or orthodox Darwinian evolution, is that these ancestral species remain essentially unchanged throughout their million-year lifespans. Yet each of them differs substantially from its immediate predecessor. So we, we have the fossil evidence across millions of years and the species stays the same. A trilobite in this layer is precisely the same trilobite in that layer, even there's a million years between them. There's no transitional forms. Not one. In addition, he writes, to the lack of a missing link to explain the relatively sudden appearance of modern man, gradualists cannot easily explain the mysterious Cambrian explosion 600 million years ago. This was an evolutionary leap that transformed the Earth from a mess of simple microscopic bacteria and blue-green algae to a planet bursting at the seams with primitive representatives of every type of multicellular plant and invertebrate animal from the lowly protozoans to such complex creatures as trilobites. What's that saying? It's saying when they look at the fossil evidence, not only do they not find an intermediary form, not only can't they find a transitional creature, there is suddenly a burst of life. And in one layer is just, as they say, bacteria and cells, and the next layer is life of trilobites and creatures and dinosaurs and things like that. So they scratch their head and think, well, well where is the transition? And no one's got an answer to the sudden burst of life. 
So, Henry Gee in 2001 wrote a book entitled Return to the Planet of the Apes and he wrote this. Fossil evidence of human evolutionary history is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. So here's a man writing in 2001 looking at all the evidence of the fossils. The evidence is fragmentary, different interpretations, but there is no evidence transitioning chimp to man. Now that surely has got to be able to ring alarm bells in people's understanding of this particular theory. I mean, here evolutionary biologists saying the evidence is not supporting. Yet it's taught in schools, it's taught more as a fact rather than a theory. Evolution too is, is not supported by the laws of genetics because we find in fact that mutations are generally harmful to the species. We become embarrassed when we see a deformity. Uh, we become embarrassed when we see a mutation because in nearly all of those cases the mutation is harmful to the species. Growing some extra fingers, extra organs, does not progress the species. We have on the screen too a little point here that the natural selection actually ignores the promise of God because you see in the Bible God says the race is not always to the swift. The race is not always won by the strong. But you see natural selection says it is. The strongest, more intelligent, better, better developed is going to win the race, is going to get through, is going to leave the others behind. But the point I'm making in that slide is, is that the mutations that occur do not advance the species. They're harmful to the species. There is no evidence that Darwin's theory of natural selection results in the emergence of new species. So we have there on the right hand side a quotation from an evolutionist. For, for natural selection to occur, a living organism must exist that is capable and successfully reproducing and also of ingesting, assimilating and processing food. So, so you have to have the evolution of food simultaneous with the evolution of the species. Secondly, a stable supply of food must be available which it can use to manufacture the various complex elements and also produce the chemical reactions necessary to obtain the energy needed to ensure the organism's survival. So you've got all these combinations. You have, in evolution, a developing cell that needs certain food. Well, you've got to have the food developing at the same time. And that food has to be the right food for the cell. And the cell has to have the capacity to, to be able to absorb the food that's being evolve and develop at the same time. And evolutionists are saying, well, how does this happen? It can't happen together. And the food supply must be stable. It's got to always be there. So if it's evolving and developing, it's not stable. So it's a huge problem that even in natural selection, the evolutionists are struggling with the fact that how is it that the cell can develop the ability to absorb food when the food's still evolving how does the cell know what mechanism to take what food if the food's not stable? So there's a problem there, an interdependence there, which doesn't work. But as far as God is concerned, everything was created after his own kind, within its own species. We spoke about the wisdom and knowledge of God in establishing not just life on earth, but earth and the sun and the solar system. Evolution has no explanation to everything fits scenario. Peter Ward, an evolutionary geologist, and Donald Brownlee, an evolutionary astronomer, both of the University of Washington, have written a book in the year 2000 called Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. And what the book did was explore exactly how our solar system fits within the framework of the galaxies and beyond and how everything is just right for life. So, these authors pointed out that 
Earth is in the right position in the galaxy. It's not near the centre, where there's high star density, high gravitational forces, dangerous supernovas, lethal radiation. It's not in the centre of the galaxy. It's, it's out, it's in one of its outer rings. It's in a system, says the authors, that enjoy just the right mass of the star, the sun. So it's not too much ultraviolet radiation. When there are solar flares, we're not incinerated. We're just the right distance from the sun. And the authors point out that in the solar system, it's, it's, it's well designed because, you see, the temperature is suitable for life, it's the right distance from the sun, and the large gravitational attraction of Jupiter makes sure that we are not bombarded by multitudes of, of debris throughout the system, because Jupiter's gravitational attraction sucks this in and keeps it away from Earth. Our planet has a very large supply of liquid water near the surface. Two-thirds of our planet is water. That is quite unique in the observable stars. And not only so, they say that that right kind of ocean in terms of pH, in terms of salinity and temperature and volume is just right to support life. Our planet has the right atmospheric properties. It has the right size to keep the atmosphere around its rim and the oceans from not flying off. It has the right amount of carbon to sustain life. It has the right tilt for the right seasons for life. It has the right moon that gives it the tides that wash and clean the oceans. And the book went on and on and on like that until suddenly you realise this is more than just blind chance. This is more than just luck. As the proverb says, by understanding has he established the earth and by wisdom has he established the foundations of the world. So you see, this isn't just a planet by chance. Evolution has no answer and the chances of getting all of that right to support life are infinitesimally great. Evolution is unable to explain symbiotic relationships. What do I mean by symbiotic relationships? Interdependent the species. Now here's a classic example between the yucca plant and the pranuba moth. In the deserts of Mexico, Southern America, it's a plant called the yucca plant. The yucca plant is a very bright and popular desert plant. It sends forth white lilies in a cluster of very sharp needle-pointed leaves. But the existence of this plant is dependent on just a few days in the year and dependent also on a moth, the pranuba moth. And what happens is, is that on certain days in the year, not very many, the yucca buds open at nightfall and emit a very strong fragrance. At the exact time the flower opens and the fragrance dissipates, we have in the ground the pranuba moth breaking out of their cocoons. Okay, so we've got timing here. Just the flowers opening, the moth is emerging from its cocoon. And as the moth gets its wings and struggles out into the air, it is drawn by the scent of the yucca plant's flowers and finally finds its way up into the stamen. There is a picture there. And the moth goes right to the top of the stamen and it scrapes the pollen and it's got rather a large head and it, in fact gathers three times the size of its head in pollen. It has quite large jaws and quite large head. And it packs and scrapes all this pollen on its head and it flies to another flower in that particular plant. It then goes to the bottom of the, the, the stamen with the pistol and it there cuts a little hole in the bottom of the pistol and it injects the next generation of moth, the eggs, into the base of that plant. It then packs those little pollen sacs which it's gathered into that hole, it just happens to fit just right, and closes the hole over. She then goes to the next flower and pollinates and so it goes on. In the meantime, 
the eggs start to hatch and develop. They have this wonderful source of food there packed in by the, the Pranuga moth. They develop, they grow, they start to eat the pollen and all of the nutrient according to that and also the seeds that are developed in that. And having eaten that, they then cut a hole in the flower and they use a little nylon thread and they go into the earth and they hatch the next generation. They just happen to eat about 20% of the seed. They leave 80% of the seed to fertilise elsewhere. Now, I want you to think about this complexity, this symbiotic relationship, this interrelationship, because we've got some really serious problems. Because evolution says the plant evolved millions of years before the moth. We've got a problem. Because that plant is absolutely dependent on that moth for survival. There is no other insect that pollinates the yucca plant. No other insect. So how possibly could this plant reproduce if the moth had not yet arrived on the scene ready for pollination? How is it that the same time the flowers are opening, the moth is coming out of the cocoon? Who timed that? A world evolution made a mistake and this moth is coming three months later. Or comes in the daytime when it's not night time and doesn't know to be attracted by the smell of the yucca plant opening up in the evening. How is it that the, the moth itself knows only to eat 20% of the eggs, not gobble them all up? How, how come it knows to leave 80% for reproduction for the future generations? You see, evolution has no answer to that. And there are many examples of the interdependent species which would be impossible if the plant evolved millions of years before the animal. It just doesn't work at all. And evolutionists have no answer to that. Evolution, in my mind also, is defeated by what we call the concept of irreducible complexity. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, you take that photograph there, a mouse trap. That mouse trap needs at least at least two or three components to work. It needs the base, it needs the actual trap that opens, it needs the spring, and it needs a mechanism which when triggered allows the trap to shut. If any one of those four things are missing, it doesn't work. It's what's called irreducible complexity. All four must be present for the thing to work. Now that presents a problem to evolution. You see, there used to be this thing called the simple cell. And as microscopes developed, as scanning microscopes developed, they suddenly realised that the simple cell is not so simple after all. It is a highly complex mechanism. And there are a number of things in that cell that have to work together for the thing to live and breathe and work. And you take any of those out and it's just like a useless mousetrap. For the simple cell, now a complex cell, it needs a membrane around which allows things to go in and out. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It needs a method of transport. That's what that whip at the end is. It needs a mechanism to absorb food. That's three things at least. Now the evolution of that cell, whilst I'm evolving an outer membrane, how do I move around? I can't. If I'm evolving an outer membrane, how do I get things through the membrane? You see, I need all of those things to work for the cell to live. Now let's take another example. Blood clotting. If we cut our cells, it releases fibrinogen, which is a, a matting compound that covers our cut with a scab and allows healing to take place. For blood clotting to work, I need at least five proteins to work. Complex proteins. Now, if I'm evolving clotting, and I haven't got all those five together, I'm going to bleed to death. And the problem evolution has is, is that it has these very complex molecules which are evolving over millions of years. But what if I only get four, not five? What if I'm still evolving two? I need another three more. I'm going to bleed to death every time I cut myself. 
So you see, ladies and gentlemen, this concept of irreducible complexity, where we need at least a number of mechanisms to work, defeats evolution. Because whilst one is evolving, the whole thing will not work, will not live. If you go to a biological textbook, do yourself a favour and look up photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the mechanism by which plants accept carbon dioxide and water and produce sugar for the plant and oxygen for the atmosphere. Now that's just a little diagram I photocopied out of one of the biological books I referenced. The book itself had 54 complex diagrams of the photosynthetic process. And you look at that, the way in which all of this works, absorbing carbon dioxide, absorbing water, feeding the plant and producing atmosphere or oxygen for the atmosphere, is intelligent. It makes sense. We plant trees today to try and soak up carbon. It gives off oxygen that we breathe and purifies the air and the plants fed. And diagram after diagram after diagram shows the complexity and the intelligence of all of this. And you can't just but stand back and be overawed by that. In wisdom thou hast made them all. Evolution has not got an answer to those kind of complexities. They're still probing how photosynthesis works at the lowest level, still probing that. We've got page after page after page detailing that. It's intelligent. It's observable. It makes sense. Hangs together logically. And all of that implies an intelligent designer. You wear watches. You, you wouldn't think that, that came out of nothing. There's design, manufacture, thought, intent. And this watch only has one purpose, to tell time can't tell time, it's a useless mechanism. You look at that and you think someone's designed that. And God is saying, have a look at that and understand that I'm an intelligent designer. One of the things that impresses me about creation is the complexity of life. And to me that presents an impossible, an impossible odds for evolution. Now, Psalm 139, verse 14, the psalmist says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, the birth of a newborn child, you know, the miracle of that, the wonder of that. Little toes, sparkling eyes, the wailing in the middle of the night, <laughs> all fearfully and wonderfully made. Just look at this. Look at our body systems, respiratory, reproductive, di digestive, circulatory, the immune system, excretory system, skeletal, it all works and functions. It all works and functions. And the complexity and the wisdom behind that to me defeats evolution because the odds of producing all of this just don't work. You take this for example. You and I consist of 75 trillion cells. I assume it's an estimate. I don't think scientists have counted every single one of them, but that just gives you the order of magnitude. And each one of these 75 million cells is surrounded by what's called a bilipid plasma membrane. A cell has to have a membrane. It's got to contain the stuff in the cell. And this lipid membrane keeps everything within the cell so it doesn't leak out. And critical cellular proteins are found within and without this membrane, as well as being embedded in mosaic patterns inside the two layers. So every cell has this, this, this lovely barrier that keeps things out and keeps things in. Now we've got an issue here, you see, because this membrane in keeping things out and keeping things in needs to have a process which is going to allow things to cross the membrane and come into the cell, otherwise the cell is not going to feed itself. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to have a barrier that keeps things out and keeps things in but allows things to go across the barrier? 
Well, here is a sentence or, or, or a paragraph or two from the University of Liverpool. This is the evolutionary description of this kind of thing. The earliest living things on the planet were self-replicating molecules which floated around in a primeval soup, busily replicating. Now, that, that's the Liverpool University explaining life in the soup. Self-replicating molecules. Isolated molecules have no internal environment and so are unable to indulge in homostasis. Homostasis is, is the ability of keeping things in, keeping things out. However, at some point, these self-replicating molecules discovered a way to isolate themselves from their immediate environment. Now, now this, this is a science university explaining how we go from a molecule to a complex cell. Molecules just kept replicating until suddenly they discovered they could group themselves together and they discovered they could isolate themselves from their environment. Now, now you and I would not accept that as a scientific explanation. If you live in a watery environment and you want a little isolation, a fat bubble is what you need because fat or oil and water don't mix. So a fat or lipid layer will act as an effective barrier to the outside world. So the molecules discover fat. And this fat surrounds the molecules and allows them to be inside a framework. It's an effective barrier. And once contained within a fat bubble, the self-replicating molecules had an internal environment they could regulate to suit themselves. So all these molecules now develop fat around them and they can now, in the barrier of the cell, start to replicate within the cell. Where did the fat come from? Who invented the fat? How did the fat evolve? Not any of those questions are answered. So, in a scholarly way, it says, at this point we can pass over several hundred million years of evolution and call these things cells. Now, now, hold on. How can you just dismiss the complexity of molecular change to cells by just saying we can pass over it several hundred million years? It just doesn't work. There's no explanation. A cell is a collection of self-replicating molecules surrounded by a fat bubble, the plasma membrane. So it goes on. Now, now th this is the University of Liverpool explaining to the public, you and I, about molecules to cells with zero, zero credibility. Where did the molecule come from? How did they replicate? Where did the fat come from? How is it that they suddenly decided to embrace molecules? So we have molecules embracing fat. And how is it that within that whole thing we suddenly become a cell over millions of years? Not one single answer. And that's the kind of approach evolutionists have. Those who look at this lipid, this fat bubble in the 75 trillion cells say that it is so complex that researchers refer it to as being alive. It, 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 apparently when you look at under this under the electro electron microscope it's, it's a pulsating living thing across the cells. It's an amazing thing where this fat lipid barrier starts to work. Let's continue on. This is just one facet of part of this remarkable system of cells. This is what's called a sodium pump or a sodium pore. So we have this fat membrane around a particular cell and, and we need to allow chemicals through the barrier. Okay, now fat and water, like oil and water, separate things out. But we need to bring in these chemicals to keep the cell alive. So, so we have what's called a pore. And this particular pore is like a pump. So when a particular molecule comes close to the membrane, this pore detects that it is the kind of molecule I need to bring into the cell. And it attracts this molecule through the gate and puts it into the cell. And another molecule comes along and the gate says, no, you're not the kind of molecule I need and the molecule continues on. Now you think about that. How is the cell going to live while the gates and the pumps aren't working, they're still evolving. Just will not work at all. And the amazing thing is, is that we have a thousand sodium pumps per square micron of plasma membrane surface. 
The total number of sodium pumps for a small neuron is one million. We have millions and millions and millions of these little pumps and gates that let molecules in and out, just the right type. How on earth can evolution work that kind of complexity? In wisdom thou hast made them all, fearfully and wonderfully made. That makes far more sense than what we read in evolutionary brochures. So, does neo-Darwinism describe in any shape, form or manner how one of these pumps could evolve through chance, time and natural processes? And the answer is they can't. If you look at the biology books and read them about these pumps, this is just one small facet of the human body. They don't have an answer to this. But the Bible does. So, there's a thing called protein folding. And these molecules come in polypeptides. And on the left hand side there you have one of these polypeptides which is a string of molecules. And it just looks like a ribbon, no shape, just a ribbon floating through your body. And these proteins need actually to trigger this, this random bit of ribbon into a special shape and a special coil and a special position within the body. Now, now, now how does that work? How is it that these random bits of ribbon suddenly coil up into the right sequence, into the right shape for the right molecular interaction called protein folding? And what they've discovered is is that when it doesn't fold properly the result is errors in the process which generate lethal, lethal effects. What are the chances, you think, of all of this stuff floating around in your body and evolution through blind chance is attempting to unfold these polypeptides and make them into the right shape and when it doesn't, it's not just harmful to the species, it's lethal to the species. See, it just doesn't work, does it? You get a couple of those making the wrong mistake and trying each time to get a right combination and you're not going to get the right effect and you're going to be lethally dead. So look at our brain. 1,500 grams that contains nerve cells of an imaginable number of nerve cells. And each one of those little nerve cells is joined by little offshoots which exchange information, synapses. And those synapses, of course, result in, like, telephone connections. And all those connections to the brain exceed the number of stars in our galaxy, just in our little brain of 1,500 grams. And we find that this particular mechanism we can smell, control a body, project thoughts, feel emotions, read and understand, intellectualize and converse. There is not a single designed machine that can match that kind of processing power. And yet we're asked to believe that this evolved over time. The sheer complexity and magnitude of that just defies imagination. So, evolutionists look at man, ways made, and chimps, and they see a similarity. Arms, legs. But the striking differences in morphology and cognitive abilities exist between humans and their closest evolutionary relatives, the chimpanzees. Striking differences. So although we may seem to be similar, there are striking differences. And what we find is that the differences are so great that man cannot bridge the gap between animal thinking and human thinking. You take our vision. Ten million cone and rod cells in the retina of the eye, packed together with a density of 200,000 per square millimetre. And each one of these little rods and cones is a photoreceptor. 
that once again the most sophisticated designed machine can't replicate. We find that the retina has 10 billion calculations every second. So whilst you're looking at me and I'm looking at you, in every second this thing has 10 billion calculations getting the image right and pushing that to the brain. How did evolution do that? I'm starting off and I have this, this glassy eye perhaps and I get one calculation. And that goes to the next generation and I get two calculations. And that might go to the next generation. In the end, how is this thing seeing? How is this thing responding? It's not. And to simulate these 10 milliseconds of the com complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations. If you've done maths at school, you know what a simultaneous equation is all about. And that takes the biggest computers, the Cray computers, minutes to process. Our eye and brain does it instantaneously, continually scanning back and forth, back and forth, to the brain and back and forth, millions of times a second. And we're asked to believe that man can design a supercomputer. And yet this complex thing called the eye, which leaves the computer in the dust, somehow evolved. It just makes no sense at all to the logical mind. How did the eye evolve? Evolutionists are no closer to a scientific explanation of that than Darwin was over 100 years ago. They just have no idea. Colour, 3D, spatial movement, spatial understanding, all of that. How on earth did that evolve? The Bible is very clear. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, some people talk about DNA similarity. We, we share the same DNA with apes, therefore we come from apes. <laughs> well, we also share the same DNA with bananas. It has no bearing at all on the logic of shared DNA. In fact, shared DNA simply means that the same creator designed the whole system. And similarities in one species, similarities in the other. What works in one works in another. Simple as that. But our final point tonight is this, that evolution offers absolutely zero hope of everlasting life. Zero hope. In fact, evolution is very, very clear. <coughs> Live your life now, because it's the only life you've got. What kind of theory or philosophy is that? It can't give you anything beyond this life, but the Bible can. If God is the creator, if his word is true, if the marvellous things that we see are a demonstration of his wisdom, then we've got to believe also, as the Bible points out, that he's going to offer people everlasting life. In Mark 16, which I'd like you to turn to, is our concluding comment tonight. Very clear, very straightforward, but profound in its implications. The Lord Jesus Christ, in speaking to his disciples just prior to his ascension to heaven, said this in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. And there it is. In the end, it is a challenge of belief systems. Do you believe God? Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the fact that there's a promise of a lasting life? Or do you believe in a theory that is bankrupt in evidence and logic and offers no hope? You see, if we can believe the things of God and we can submit to baptism, then we can be saved. And that to me is the greatest challenge to evolution. Evolution holds nothing like that. There is no future with evolution. But with God, there is everything. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope we've given you some thought-provoking ideas tonight. Happy to talk more about this, but more importantly, we're happy to talk about the things of eternal life in the Bible. Thank you.